All right, I think we should probably kick this thing off then. Welcome everyone to the Origin DeFi community call. Uh, we started doing this around a month ago, had a few bumpy starts, but uh, hopefully the fourth time's the charm. Purpose of this meeting is to share what we're working on, uh, but also invite you to contribute, uh, whether that's on the engineering, uh, business or product side, um, but also just um, you know let us know your perspective as a DeFi user, that sort of thing. On the agenda for today, uh, we have uh, several announcements. Then we'll have highlights and lowlights from the prior week. We'll do some sprint planning, then have a discussion from a handful of people on the engineering and product sides. And then we'll do some introductions uh, around the end, maybe in 30 or 45 minutes. Yeah, let us know more about uh, how you learned about Origin, uh, what you've been working on, um, what you're excited about in DeFi. I'm going to just say that uh, for talking back to us during the meeting, you can use the Origin Dollar discussion channel, um, just the regular one in the Origin Dollar category, and we'll be watching that during the meeting. Um, and so feel free to say things, you know, as we're talking or in the middle of it, whatever you'd like to. Uh, back to you, Micah, hopefully. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, Let's uh, get started with announcements first. The uh, OUSD DAP was recently approved by uh, Gnosis Safe, um, and so it's now in their default apps list. Are there any other announcements from anyone? Our uh, curve vault is still ongoing. Um, was a bug in the UI, so we had to reissue it. Um, but that is uh, still ongoing. We still need to work on um, getting more uh, votes for it. But once, uh, if and when that is approved, then we'll be able to be eligible for CRB rewards uh, in our curve pool, which would be cool. OK, let's talk about uh, highlights and lowlights from the prior week. On the positive side of things, um, we have an active OGN chat uh, Telegram group. Then uh, OUSD total supply is continuing to move up. Um, where are we at now, Daniel? I think it's around 25 million. Yeah, 25.3 million now. Cool. <clears throat> Uh, the team is uh, is making a lot of progress, and we're on track to implement um, a bunch of recommended improvements from the Open Zeppelin audit. And uh, are there, um, let's see, are there any other uh, highlights to recognize? I'll just say our uh, one low light is our current APY being at 3.72. Mm. Uh, not competitive at all. That's not going to. That's not going to cut it. Um, so we hit we rebase to... on it. See what happens. That number actually pulls uh, only if rebase has happened. Try rebase. See what it goes to. Let, let's do that. Uh, does anyone uh, in particular want to fire that? It'd even be better with a harvest, but uh, I'd probably actually double with a car. A rebase will catch some of it, and a harvest will catch the rest of it. But yeah, just uh, I can run a rebase after this meeting. All right. Um, any other highlights or lowlights to recognize? So, hey, this is Frank. Just wanted to recognize the, the fast progress from uh, Daniel and Tom on the um, uh, improvements uh, that came out of the uh, Open Zeppelin audit. Um, you guys have been moving like super fast. I'm like reviewing like 10 PRs a day. Uh, so thanks a lot for uh, being so thorough and you know going through the audit and and implementing even like some minor things, some things that could seem minor like comments in the code. But in the end, it all makes a big difference in terms of um, you know making sure OUSD is a super high quality um, 
uh, contract. So thank you guys. Um, I actually have a question going back to the low light of the low APY. So uh, I see the 3.72% seven day average, but if we go to like the daily amounts, um, the math does not seem to be right. Yes, um, so uh, yes. And that's probably my fault for having those two numbers driven by different things. The APY that is shown there is how much the user has would actually have gained over that time period by what's in their wallet. Whereas the daily APY pages is actually how much the protocol is growing, um, not including or um, without re rebases. So it's what's it's how much the vault holdings are growing, and so that's much more up to date. However, that also does not take into account any sales of uh, rewards tokens. And usually rewards token sales are about 50% of our APY right now. So uh, between, you know, the first number is low because we haven't had a recent rebase. There's uh, $10,000 in there waiting to rebase. Um, but it's also not including recent rewards tokens. So uh, as soon as a rebase happens, that number should go up. And then as soon as... Um, uh, rewards tokeners are sold and will go up even more, as will actually the numbers on the analytics page for the day that the uh, rewards tokens are sold. Yeah, I think we should make those numbers consistent, and then we should use the uh, chain link keepers or whatever mechanism we're using to poke the contracts daily so we don't have this, this sort of weirdness. Yeah, I think just poking it every day would be a good thing. Yeah, including the harvest. Yep, yeah, that's in the list on the, uh, the, the keeper poking. Okay, cool, let's make that an action item. Okay, uh, any other uh, highlights or lowlights or should we get into sprint planning? We announced the DAP upgrade publicly also, Domain wrote a blog post and it's out there. So just wanted to flag that as well as uh, positive uh, things that happened last week. Thanks, Doman. One other thing that I uh, was going to mention earlier is that we have a uh, back channel uh, for this meeting in uh, the Origin Discord. You can go there at originprotocol.com slash discord. It's in the Origin Dollar discussion channel. Um, and so that's where we we'll post links uh, to many of the things that we talk about here. Okay, uh, for the upcoming sprint, which starts on this Thursday, I believe, uh, we have a two week sprint cycle. So one of them ends on Wednesday and the new one starts on Thursday. There are uh, five, uh, I think, big projects that are currently slated. The first one would be mainnet upgrades uh, involving uh, fixes from our recent Open Zeppelin audit and then enabling our Aave uh, V2 strategy that we're relaunching. And then uh, we talked in this meeting about the convex uh, strategy a few times. There's a precision upgrade uh, that uh, is also linked in the notes. And then Doman's changes to the DAP, uh, which automatically route transactions to the most economically beneficial contract. Those would, um, uh, he would add uh, sushi swap transaction routing and Uniswap V2 transaction routing to that uh, project. Anything else that stands out um, that should be a high priority for the coming two weeks? No, I think the, the audit fixes are the big one. Okay, we'll come back to that uh, periodically um, next week and the following week to see how things are going. On the uh, engineering side, uh, we have a few topics to cover. Um, Daniel, you wanna go first and let us know what happened with Cream and uh, AMP today? Here's a quick overview of the Cream AMP hack that happened last night for roughly $20 million. Cream is a lending platform like Aave or Compound. It's actually a fork of Compound. So you supply some money on this side and then you can use a percentage of that 
funds that you supply to borrow money as well. So if I put in a million dollars worth of ETH, I could then borrow $750,000 worth of some other token on this side. The attacker uh, attacked both the ETH and the AMP pools, uh, and we'll see how in a second. Now, Cream did have an audit to check the changes that they made from uh, Compound. Uh, this audit has a list of things that make a token uh, not vulnerable to an attack. Let's go here and see that uh, on that list is it should not be an ERC-777 token and has no external function calls and transfer and transfer from. Now AMP, if we go look at that, uh, it's designed to support multiple classes of collateralization systems and it's inspired by ERC-777 um, and it makes external function calls during its transfer method. So what's that mean? Um, when a contract calls AMP and says transfer, instead of just updating the, send, the to and from balances, uh, AMP then calls out to a registry, checks to see if the receiver wants to run any code, and if the person receiving the AMP wants to do anything, then it will call on to that. Now in the original AMP system, it's intended that this be uh, internal AMP mon manager systems, but uh, in this case, it can also be an attacker. Then AMP can call this, and while the other contract is in the middle of transferring funds, the attacker can call back into the contract and have something else get done in the middle of it. So if we look at the actual attack transaction here, the attacker first flash loans 500 ETH, and then deposits this into Cream, uh, giving them a certain amount of collateral. They then take the collateral they have and they use all available to borrow AMP tokens, which works out to be 19.4 million AMP tokens. And then the cream contract transfers this to the attacker. So if we look at the source of the cream contract here, this is the uh, borrow function up here. Just before the transfer happens, we update our internal stuff and check if a borrow is possible. This is not actually writing though to the contract storage locations. Instead, it's writing just to temporary memory. Then we do the transfer out, in which case uh, the money, the AMP is transferred to the attackers. And as we saw in here, the attacker actually gets a chance to run code right here in the middle before any of the storage slots, before how much has been borrowed has been updated. Um, while they're right here in the middle here in this transfer, here's the attacker's code going, they do a second borrow of ETH. So now the attacker has two 75% collateral loans totaling 150% of the original amount that they were supposed to have. Um, and they optimize this even further by not just stopping here, but then by also uh, liquidating their previous position uh, somewhere in here. But that's the, uh, the very basics of this attack is they borrow twice off the same collateral uh, and which lets them get a whole lot more than they started with. And they repeated these uh, transactions over and over again, uh, getting more each time. So that was basically the attack. It entirely happened, you know, it happened for two reasons. One is the cream contract didn't, uh, could only operate cleanly on very trusted ERC-20s that don't do callbacks. And it also happens because an ERC-20 doing callbacks on transfers uh, has been known, you know, is, is on the list of things you don't do because you get into this exact situation. Um, typically, only if you, yeah, typically you would hack a contract by writing a ERC-20 that they would trust that would do something devious. In this case, a trusted ERC-20 was allowed to run devious code. That's the, uh, the short one on the cream hack. Yeah, Daniel, maybe, oh, sorry, questions. go ahead, Jeff.
Yeah, I was going to say a few interesting questions there. I mean, AMP is on Coinbase and other exchanges, we're on a lot of AMMs. Like, uh, is there other, other attacks that are possible um, at this point with AMP? I think so. It's a really scary thing it's doing. Uh, it's not going to be Uniswap. It's not going to bother. Um, Uniswap is designed to run on untrusted coins. Um, it's really something that expects good behavior as opposed to something that uh, will run on any arbitrary system. Yeah, I wonder if uh, Compound have patched this because uh, Cream was an exact fork of, of Compound. Um, I just looked at, yeah, I have to, to see. Um, the code looks similar in it uh, at the moment, but I haven't actually checked to see if there's anything preventing this. Daniel, maybe uh, you can post some of your visuals in uh, the back channel. Yep, doing that now. Cool. Any other questions for Daniel? Do you know what they were trying to um, <clears throat> achieve by being ERC-777? Like, was there a mechanism for, I don't know, some sort of reward on transfer or something along those lines? I haven't tracked down the exact reason or, you know, exactly how the AMP system worked. I was more focused on the, um, the cream side of it. Uh, from the comments, they say that they have multiple collateral managers, and it seems like there's, uh, in reading the AMPs, in AMPs audit, uh, their own system actually suffered from this kind of vulnerability before they, uh, the auditors caught it and they fixed it in their own ecosystem. Um, but yeah, I don't exactly know how it worked. I haven't figured that out yet. Or the intended way it was supposed to work. All right, if there aren't any other questions, then uh, maybe Tom, uh, you want to let us know the current status of the Ave strategy redeployment? Uh, so this was mostly a Daniel thing. He redid the strategy. Um, I think it's as I'm aware, it's ready to go. It's been reviewed. It's been merged. Um, and at this stage, I think when we finish the Open Zeppelin uh, work, we'll we've got a few things on the list to do, sort of immediately after that. But we'll start to look at writing the deployment stuff then and getting it up and running. Uh, I guess it'll be sort of in a week or so. Yeah, I think the deployment stuff's written, but yeah, it's pinning the rest of it. Yeah, so, so basically like just waiting a, on the audit work. Okay. Can we have like a, a target date in mind for when uh, funds might get allocated to that strategy since they've all been on compound for a long time? I'd say early, mid next week. Would that sound reasonable, Daniel? <laughs> I think everything's uh, ready to go in the contract and the uh, deploy script is written. So yeah, it's just whenever you're freed up from finishing the audit stuff, which we should finish the audit stuff first. But yeah, I don't think there's any other blockers. Sounds good. Doman, uh, how about this uh, default OUSD dev mode? Um, cool, yeah, I just wanted to talk a bit um, from, from, from my experience when I was integrating Uniswap. Um, you know, integrating Uniswap, I did it in a way where um, I would, you know, deploy all the all the necessary core Uniswap contracts and all the periphery Uniswap contracts, which are like I don't know the deployer and the liquidity manager and uh, and, and whatever else contracts you needed to 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 like figure out the exchange rates and stuff like that. And and it's it's. It's just like a lot of, it just feels like it's like a lot of unnecessary work to then in the end, you know, call like three different functions to get the like exchange rate into the, the, the swap. Um, and um, yeah, it just, it just doesn't seem, it just, it just doesn't seem like a good approach because a lot of times uh, it's not very well documented how to, how to set up the whole ecosystem and it's just going to burn through, through like, a lot of developer a lot of developer time and in the end you don't get you know the there's some downsides still in the end um so so yeah i i'm thinking that 
um, it's probably good for the default development mode on USD to be ru to be running in node forked mode. So that means it's it's going to mirror the mainnet. Um, it might maybe you know when we'll be developing new contracts or something. It might it might make more sense to run it in 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 like the the normal mode uh, for like easier development. But um, for doing stuff like this, for for integrating new contracts, it's just gonna save probably like three quarters of like project time just to, to just run it in fork mode. And and when I did the Uniswap um, thing, there was also like uh, there was like also a downside that when we deployed it to mainnet, you know, because of for example Oracle prices and um, like different initializations of 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 third party contracts there were bugs that surfaced on the mainnet that weren't present um in, in the like default developer mode so it seems like you know like a lot of hassle to then being in such a non-perfect state that doesn't uh, really reflect the mainnet uh, as well so um so yeah um I guess um, I think like a few helper functions will need to be developed. We we got a lot of helper functions already done. Just they just need to be made more convenient. So for example, you can easily get like a lot of stable coins when running in forked mode. So um, <clears throat> I'm just gonna write uh, a, a couple of stuff that you'll just put like a, an address in an environmental variable, and it's gonna you know get some stable coins from Binance's address or something and and we can have like most of the most of the benefits and and none of the uh, shortfalls of 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 running in fork mode um so yeah and that's that's what i'm doing for curve right now um so i'm just running in fork mode so it's really it's a lot less painful you don't need to dive into their source code and figure out what is going on in there uh, just you know just call the functions and and it's going to be super easy the downside is that those those contracts are not going to be supported in in the, in the normal mode, so like in the default node mode. Um, so yeah, that, that's that's what I'm thinking would be like the good approach. Uh, I don't know. This this isn't a discussion, is it? Oh yeah, it is under discussion. So <laughs> uh, if anybody has some feedback on that, um, maybe I'm overlooking something, but. Uh, I think that'd be like uh, it'd be good actually to, to to run OUSD when developing by default in in fork mode. Yeah, I agree. Particularly with other protocols and stuff, it's way better um, to actually use the real thing. Um, and other stuff is a huge pain to set up the ecosystem, you know, the whole contract ecosystem for every system that we support. Um, plus, it throws some random chaos data at you uh, because things are moving. The only downside, you know, it's it's really kind of the perfect setup. The only downside is that the fork mode is sometimes unreliable and sometimes will, you know, just flake out over and over again. And it's been getting much better over the years. Um, and that's how I work when doing the strategies. Um, the last several sets of strategies have been entirely done in fork mode. And uh, it's, it's much better to actually, you know, run your stuff that way. Uh, yeah, only downside is that, you know, fork may just decide to break horribly on you for two hours. Um, but when it's running, it's the right way. And, you know, hopefully, eventually, people get the tooling to the point that it's solid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was impressed that you were able to get uh, Uniswap running on that last one inside our ecosystem. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it was painful. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Daniel, maybe a related question that you I think touched on there um, uh, about getting all the contracts uh, set up in the environment that are, are that impact the the whole um, equation. Um, I think Kuroge was asking recently about why we don't have a testnet environment uh, for like staging. Do you want to um, expand on that a little bit? Primarily because so much, you know, OUSD's entire existence is to invest into other contracts. And so while that would require us to basically maintain an up-to-date copy of all the other things like uh, Doman was talking about. Uh, and we do have a fork set up 
locally that we can run uh, that gives you basically that world. So that's, that's kind of what Dome was talking about. Basically, if you're testing OUSD, you kind of need to run your own fork on it if you're doing kind of local development, local testing stuff. That way you have a copy of the entire mainnet basically on your computer running. Um, it only downloads the stuff that it needs as it needs to touch a contract. It downloads the source code for that contract or the um, and the when it messes with a storage variable, it, it downloads the current value of that storage variable. So it's not like downloading a, a 50 mega or 50 gigabyte system or something. You know, it's it just basically kicks off running practically instantly. Um, and so it's not when it works, it's not a uh, a problem to use. But that's why we don't have a staging environment, is because we would then have to keep that staging environment live with every contract in OUSD, you know, every contract in the DeFi inter ecosystem, including oracles that OUSD interacts with. Um, maybe it makes some sense to sometime in the future to set up a node that would run in fork mode, which you know the staging environment would connect to. So so you wouldn't need to spend the actual you know, ETH and, and, and stable coins to test it. My concern would just be the reliability. If we could magically get one that would be reliable and maybe just have to have a, a button to boot it, but you know, it, yeah, it crashes often enough. We could try the, uh, the Tenderly. They have a, a system for it, right? That you can spin up forks and shut them down. That'd be worth a shot. Any yeah. other questions? Uh, Frank, go ahead. I was just wondering, um, uh, do you guys think we could use a uh, fork mode when we do um, in the future, hopefully some, uh, when we write some integration UI tests? Do you think it's reliable enough? I guess it's it's a matter of reliability. It's the same, uh, same thing. Well, the difference there would be the data could be very, very different. Uh, one minute there might be a bunch of money someplace, and next money there, you know, next time we run it, there might be not be um, so uh, you'd be difficult to write the test you'd have to kind of push the m money around to get into a known state before you could really start yeah good point Tim. i'd be afraid of broken tests yeah i guess let's bring that something we can, sorry go ahead Domin. yeah i just wanted to add that we can specify a block number you know where, where the node forks from but uh Probably whenever we do significant changes on mainnet and increase that block number, we might need to, as Daniel said, like correct the tests uh, that, that that just break because of the change state uh, with a new block number. Yeah, I mean, I guess maybe for integration tests, um, uh, having like some super basic marks that we can control from the the testing environment might, um, I mean, might make more sense. I'm just thinking about. UI test as you know, if we want the community to be able to efficiently and, and quickly, you know, um, help on, on the UI, like we're going to need to have some sort of uh, integration testing. Otherwise, you know, it means like, you know, when we review PR, we have to bring up the, um, uh, the, the branch and test it locally, manually. It's just not scalable. And that's something I'm worried about right now. Uh, but in the future, just wanted to, um, you know, to make sure we think about how we would get there. Yeah, that's a good point. On the contract side, we have mocks for everything and unit tests for everything. Um, so, you know, we could extend those mocks just a little bit with something to get every all the data that's needed for the UI side. And so, in theory, we could uh, support the UI testing from mocks. I'd feel a lot more comfortable with that uh, than using production live production stuff for the mock test or the for the. Uh, UI testing. Yep, good. All right, let's move on to a few um, product-related uh, topics. First, uh, we have Pierogi, who um, did a, a quick survey of um, analytics dashboards throughout the ecosystem. You want to uh, tell us about your findings, Pierogi? Hey, sure. Hey, everyone. So I was following up on the points on uh, needing to clean up the UX of the analytics page and figure out how to best display the API balance and lifetime earnings. So the goal was, I thought the goal was to highlight the best, the benefits of holding OUSD and also what the other stable coins do. Um, so I surveyed the 
dashboards for like fiat backed, crypto backed, and algorithmic stable coins. And uh, the highlights from what I found was there was a good uh, countdown timer for um, some of the rebasing uh, stable coins. And then, and then there were uh, bar graphs for um, yield earn for some of the uh, rebasing contracts as well. And some of them had like 24 hour bar graphs or one week or uh, 30 day um, charts. And then for strategy allocations, I saw a commonality between them were using pie, chart, pie charts. And uh, I thought that was visually um, easier to, to understand. Uh, now on to the trading section. Um, most of these were also uh, graphs. Uh, and these are trading volume, uh, number of trades, and uh, unique actions on the protocol, uh, which right now we have like line by line uh, each action. But I think it would be good to see like um, a graph of these actions too. And yeah, that's about it. And then uh, I guess we could also put like uh, next to the pie charts uh, just numbers on values of the amounts, which uh, currently is showing. So yeah, that's about it. I'll share the link in the back channel. Oh, never mind. I got it. <laughs> Thanks for doing that. Hey. That's, uh, <laughs> you make great points. Sorry, it took me a, a minute to get back to unmute. Mm -hmm. Karoge, are there, are there any um, questions that you think uh, are most important for us to be able to answer with the dashboard or um, uh, that we should be asking internally or that people in the community uh, would want to know? I, oh yeah, I, I focused on on-chain data because uh, it didn't seem like Google Analytics data would be aligned with the decentralized thesis. Um, and yeah, I guess analytics data would be more a back-end focus for um, how to improve the uh, Yeah. Or <laughs> yeah. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that's something that I recognized um, after seeing your findings was um, there really probably aren't many uh, questions that we would want to ask ourselves internally that wouldn't be of interest um, externally to the community. So I think you're right. We should focus on uh, on chain data and. Um, anything that uh, is relevant to the entire protocol. Mm -hmm. On that topic, I, I mentioned last week that we had a, a doc from, I don't know, nine or 10 months ago um, that uh, asked a lot of those questions and tried to figure out um, what, uh, what we should prioritize on the analytics and metrics uh, side. And so I uh, still intend to revisit that doc. I didn't get to it in the past week but uh, I'll make sure that it's still linked in the notes and uh, we can come back to that and uh, check in on it next week. So if that's something that uh, anyone is uh, particularly interested in, then uh, let us know and, um, or, or just comment in that doc. Um, let us know what you think. All right, uh, we have another um, bit of research that uh, Tate did over the past week. Tate, you want to tell us what you came up with? Sure. Uh, hey, everyone. I uh, took some of the uh, questions that uh, Josh had proposed in the last community call. So the first one being, uh, are OS o OUSD holders profitable taking kind of gas and other costs into consideration? Uh, and the second being, uh, are OUSD holders uh, likely to come back and deploy more capital or have they, uh, or do they have even more capital to deploy into? So um, I did post a doc in the discussion channel for OUSD uh, that kind of highlighted clips from some of those uh, posts, um, but to kind of summarize overall, uh, I did post a summary as well, but to summarize here again, um, they said, yes, it was profitable, 
Uh, but it wasn't necessarily profitable at the retail level. I think that we were talking about or aiming for at the kind of, you know, sub 500, sub 1000 level. Uh, they were considering it profitable uh, in the tens of thousands range, um, and they were taking into consideration the cost of the time and also the allocation. So it's like if I'm putting $50,000 to work for two months to get the return that I expect, uh, then where else could have that you know uh, been more uh, efficiently deployed? And when it boils down to it, I think that's kind of what their overall thinking is, is it's, it just yield, yield is a commodity. They're just kind of moving around and trying to find uh, the best yield and, without consideration of kind of the project at, at the point. And I think to answer the kind of moving to the second point, uh, the way that they feel that they would move beyond that and they would allocate to origin kind of beyond just a, a yield perspective is it, if it became um, kind of more of a utility in the sense of like there were more pairs available or uh, it was, uh, there was a better fiat on ramp that was some of the ones they were coming back with. Um, if they basically could hold it in, in place of holding die, you know, if they have like a you know thirty percent allocation of their uh, of their portfolio is in stables that they're used to kind of move in and out of uh, uh, opportunities, uh, and they want to kind of have that there liquid uh, to make that OUSD, um, you basically have to like improve the cost of the path so that they're not having to like move into USD out to die and then to like deploy die somewhere else. They're actually holding OUSD to like then deploy directly, um, and then yeah, uh, I think the only other thing that was brought up was. Um, some of the people that were kind of tangentially familiar with the product had heard about the hack um, and then kind of stopped paying attention to it uh, after that. Um, and then when I brought up the kind of multiple uh, audits since then and the insurance product, uh, most weren't aware of the audits and only a couple were aware of the insurance product. So maybe some more kind of familiarity on that front would bring some more kind of um, uh, light to the project. Very cool, Tate. Yeah. yeah. Th thanks so much for doing that. Thanks for sharing that. Can you um, can you shed a little bit of light at all on um, who these potential users are? Like, uh, do you know oh, anything yeah. about uh, about uh, what they look like? Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, I, there. So the DeFi Innovation Channel. Um, there are some nonces there, but the one the responses that I got uh, in talking to them and kind of seeing their history. Uh, I'd say half of them were kind of admins in the channel, so they're pretty heavy DeFi users. I wouldn't consider them like novice users, so like the people that you kind of would just want to feed on ramp into uh, OUSD and then just kind of hold it, and they wait for rebase, and that's their exposure to DeFi. These people are actively trading and looking for different strategies, so they'd be more on the experience end uh, of retail. And then I think there's a pretty even distribution of like the uh, allocation size they're doing. Like some of these guys are you know very crypto rich and being able to deploy a lot of capital. And some of them uh, have the same kind of uh, knowledge, but just a little less capital to deploy. But uh, to kind of go towards the second question, like they would absolutely be able to deploy more capital in the OUSD if they found it to be a, a more advantageous opportunity. Thanks so much for doing that. No problem. Anyone else uh, have any questions for Tate or thoughts on? Uh um, how we how we take that information and act on it. I think uh, for me, it's just a, a reminder that we need to do a lot more uh, user research, something we did uh, quite a bit of late last year, maybe beginning of this year, um, but uh, it hasn't been a, a top priority on the OUSD side. Uh, in the last few weeks, and so it's something we want to um, do a lot more of. Uh, sorry, Mike, I just, if you mind, I add uh, one more thing I just forgot to add was they... Please do, yeah. Uh, um, the other the other thing that would make it kind of more of an um, opportunity for them was if it was also kind of like a more kind of ubiquitous spendable asset. So if there were other things that they could then spend that currency on, just like more of a, you know, regular currency. So uh, that was another thing that they brought up. Great. You know, I'm wondering uh, if actually having getting OUSD on Compound in the end could basically even as an intermediate step to spendable everywhere. But even if you could hold stables in a uh, a way that would let you be growing them on a on a uh, or you know using it, both that OUSD and something else at the same time, you know, borrow something else with it or something. But yeah. Yeah, we want to get to the point where it's a medium of exchange because that's that's where the money is. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. 
All right, there are a couple of other things uh, that we've been working on on the um, product design side, um, kind of smaller changes to the front end interface on our DAP that I just wanted to uh, check in on uh, because we would talked about it, uh, I think, in, in prior meetings here. So um, on the, you know, the main page of the DAP, ousd.com slash swap, uh, there are, uh, we have the APY there, uh, the user's balance, um, the pending earnings that uh, will arrive um, uh, at the next rebase, assuming uh, that there aren't any changes there. Um, we are going to do a little bit of a refresh on that design. And I think uh, there are a few more tweaks that uh, we'll have Ari make before someone implements that. But uh, just uh, an update that we're making progress there. It's um, something that we should be able to book in the upcoming sprint that starts later this week. And then the other thing that uh, we haven't quite gotten as far on, but should be relatively simple, is making it possible for users to override the default selection um, that is made. You know, the DAP calculates uh, what's the best contract to route the transaction through, uh, but it makes some assumptions uh, when it does that. And so we want the user to be able to um, override that selection, and we just need to confirm what kind of UI elements uh, we want for that and how to communicate it. So I'll be following up with Ari uh, and see if he hasn't already done that. Any other questions or comments on product or engineering? Yeah, uh, I ran the rebase and the APY is now showing uh, much higher uh, at 12.2%. And that's still underestimating it because it's still not including uh, rebasing token or selling rewards tokens. And Daniel, that's the seven day trailing uh, APY, is that right? Yes. Did we want to go ahead and switch that to be 30 day by default and then um, yeah. eventually give give the user the ability to um, toggle that in the analytics page? Yeah, and we could probably go ahead and yeah, do that change this week. Okay. Uh, do you want to do that or uh, should somebody else be the owner of switching from 7 to 30? Yeah, I'll do it. Okay. Sounds like an action item. I'll put it in the notes. Josh, uh, do you want to give us an update on uh, the curve um, uh, gauge vote that you posted about in Discord? Yes, yeah, so um, we have a gauge vote up. Um, Cover been working hard to make their protocol more permissionless, and so we've been taking uh, iterative steps towards um, that process. Um, first step was allowing people to launch our own pools, curve pools. So we've done that. We've added $5 million of liquidity uh, to that pool. Um, and then the second step was uh, creating a gauge. So we now have a UI for creating gauges. We've done that. Uh, and then the third step was uh, actually uh, putting it to a DAO vote um, to add that gauge into their registry, which then allows people to, uh, or CRV holders to vote specifically uh, BE CRV, which are the locked votes uh, of, of CRV, uh, to vote on uh, what percentage of the new CRV emissions would get distributed to the OUSD pool. Uh, and so that's where we are right now. Uh, we submitted that proposal. The next day we say, oh, sorry, you've got to do it again. Uh, and so we're, um, we, we reposted it again. Um, but we're struggling a bit on getting votes. Um, some of the people we um, got to participate first time around, uh, haven't come back to vote a second time. So I um, need to do some um, nagging uh, to get those, those votes in. Uh, but we have a long way to go. So we, we really need the Curve team to uh, come through for us on that. Uh, but the link is here in the notes. Um, if you do have a vote lock CRV, please uh, do go in and support uh, and cast your vote for that. What's the timeline uh, timeline on getting that approved, Josh? It's a seven day. Uh, it's a seven day vote. Um, Looks like we're three days into it. Have four days yeah. left. Yep. Okay. Uh, is there anywhere um, uh, for anyone here who doesn't have uh, uh, VECRV? Is there anything they can do uh, to spread the uh, word or? Uh, uh, so, so someone uh, I hadn't the link uh since this morning uh we are it looks like it's passed so uh we're at the 41 percent we need 30 percent minimum so 
Um, that's great news. Uh, so unless someone else comes in and votes it down, <laughs> uh, l- looks like we're in a good place. Okay, awesome. nobody vote. Nobody do anything. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so what's uh, what's very the next happy. step after? The, yeah. What, what's the next step yeah, after so, that? Presumably passes. Yeah. So the next step after that um, is to use a bribe interface. Uh, if you guys have seen this, so it's, uh, it's I think it's bribe.curve.fi, uh, and it basically allows you to offer rewards. Uh, for in our case, it'll be OGN rewards um, to anyone who votes to give us CRV. Um, and so we basically um, put some OGN up as a bribe to get CRV holders to uh, give us uh, CRV. You know, obviously the more OGN we put up, the more votes we can get um, for, for USD and then we can, uh, the origin dollar pool can take a larger and larger share of the total CRV emissions, which in turn brings in more capital to the origin dollar pool. Okay. Uh, well, I linked to that uh, in the notes, and um, unless there are any other questions or comments about Curve, then uh, I think the next topic is uh, just letting everyone know that there. Um, and actually, if you're in the uh, OGN chat uh, Telegram group, you would have already seen this. Um, there's a recent governance proposal on our uh, governance uh, portal proposing to alternate the topic of this meeting between DeFi and NFT each week. Uh, so if you go to vote.originprotocol.com, it's the top, uh, it's the first uh, proposal listed there. And I think it has another couple of days or so to go. Uh, one day, yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other uh, business topics that we should touch on? Uh, I, I, I mean, at this point, the, um, it looks like this proposal to alternate between NFT and DeFi Weekly uh, is probably going to pass. Um, it's got 64% support versus 35%, so quite likely uh, will will pass. Um, and so what we're planning to do with that is we're actually going to um, spend a little bit of a time in this meeting in the DeFi Weekly. We're going to keep the schedule the same, but we'll spend 10 minutes going over uh, updates uh, from the NFT team uh, until we get to the point where we have um, enough uh, content that it justifies breaking out into a completely separate meeting. Um, and so we're going to we're going to ramp that up slowly, um, but assuming that passes uh, tomorrow, that will be um, our plan um, going forward. Okay, two meetings for the price of one. Two updates. <laughs> Well, if there aren't any other topics to cover right now, then um, I think uh, we can open the floor uh, for anyone that has not introduced themselves yet. I don't know if anyone is here that hasn't been in any of the prior meetings, but um, uh, if you want to uh, tell us um, what you're excited about, what you're working on, uh, how you learned about origin, that sort of thing, now would be a good time to do that. If not, then uh, we will try again next week. Um, feel free to invite anyone to this meeting. If you think they might be interested in OUSD or just um, getting involved in a, in a DeFi project, we'd love to hear from them. Okay, there were uh, a few action items from last week and then a new one from this week, which I forgot to add to the notes. That was for Daniel to um, switch the defaults APY measurement from seven to 30 days. Then uh, from uh, prior weeks, uh, I'm going to refresh the analytics metrics doc, uh, still planning to do that. Coleman, you were going to work on uh, coin market cap DeFi and coin market cap stablecoin lists. Um, did you happen to make any progress on that? Uh- these are things that you submit via request forms and they specifically ask you not to back channel um so i had submitted these requests probably a month ago or more at this point 
I don't think that there's any additional action I can take. I can try okay. to back channel, but they've told us not to do that. All right. Sounds like it's done for now then. Thanks for that. Uh, then there were some uh, tool tips, um, help icons that we were gonna put in the DAP. Uh, we need a little bit of content for that. I've, uh, I've put that on the back burner, at least on my list, because I think it will um, depend a little bit on how we end up doing the UI for the uh, overriding the default contract and that sort of thing. I think some of that might move around. Um, so I'll, I'll come back to that, haven't forgotten to do it. Uh, and then Coleman, there were a couple other old ones uh, following up on Ledger Live and uh, then the Uniswap token lists. Anything to report on either of those? Uh, yeah, I, I thought I went over it last week, but um, Le Ledger hasn't gotten, they, they seem to be confused about uh, OGN versus OUSD. I clarified that for them, but their response time is very slow and they're using like a Trello board for um, for adding new tokens. I suppose I could uh, bug them again about it, but um, you know, I think it's it took them quite a while to respond to our, my first uh, inquiry since uh, Josh had posted like in November of last year or something like that. Um, the uh, for Uniswap, um, I from what I recall, they're governance uh, process for this is pretty uh, much it's pretty bare like I, I didn't really see that much discussion it's just a bunch of random projects asking for their token to be added to the default list I'm, I'm not sure what we can really do about that there's you know as you can imagine they probably get 10,000 requests a day from you know random low cap coins begging to be added to their uh, default list I'm not really sure what we can do about that. Maybe if someone knows someone high up at Uniswap, we could back channel, but I really doubt that our, a pull request or uh, an email is gonna, is gonna stand out given the number of requests they get. Okay. Well, uh, we'll come back to it. Um... Uh, next week or the week after. Um, but if anybody has any suggestions on how to make either of those happen, it would be much appreciated. Any other closing thoughts before we wrap this one up? All right, well, um, keep an eye open uh, in the back channel. I'm sure there'll be some follow-up discussion um, maybe on the, uh, on the cream uh, AMP uh, attack if, if it hasn't already happened. Um, and then uh, we'll see you next week and be thinking about any um, agenda uh, topics or discussion topics that you'd like us to cover next week besides uh, NFTs, which we'll get into a little bit. Until then. Thanks, all. Have a good one. Thanks, everyone. See you. See you, guys.